keyboard player. And what happened was, was I sent him um, some money to get his album, The Model- Chron- Chronicles of Modern Life, which I discovered when I was on holiday in Perrinport in Cornwall. And I had quite an interesting exchange because I think you were there that night, Dave. Do you remember the night at the Black Ball? Uh, there was, well, I went to quite a few of them, so you had to be a bit more it specific is, yeah. than that. <laughs> it was July 2014, and what happened was, was uh, there was one of the number who was not necessarily a friend of mine, but we, we do know him, Judith, because uh, he goes to rock and roll night on a regular basis. And um, this guy decided that he was going to do his songs come Hello Waters High. And as a result, a whole night overran by about half an hour. And Henry Priestman, the feature... Sounds like Bruce Springsteen was there. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I I wouldn't have minded, I tell you. I mean, I was just... uh, Should I got the inspiration from? (laughs) Well, put it this way, I mean, I was born to run away. Never mind, born to run. Yeah, but it was (laughs) was one of those nights. By the way, uh, do you all know each other? I mean, have you all been chatting since... uh, I had my yeah, we've been talking my... about you. Yeah, yeah. We, were, we, were, we were sharing a group chat on my mobile twice. phone about you, Andrew. Mm. <laughs> oh, my God. It was a well, bit spicy to let out on Facebook, though, Tony. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to give you three things. Three things. Now, don't shout out if you know Wallet. me. Right? <laughs> three things about me that not many people know. Go on, then. I could give Ready? you 1,003. <gasps> Right, number one, I won a prize at school. Right, number two, I have appeared on a very well known television quiz. Right, and number three, I once auditioned for a band who later became well known. Are we meant to guess these? Well, tell me which of these you think is a lie. Okay, of, oh, of any of those three, yeah, the quiz show. Can you say it again? Say the free again, please. Yes, of course I will. N- um, right, number one was... Oh, God, I've forgotten what they were. Um, <laughs> one... <laughs> it's a lie. I, I bought this book about amnesia, but, you know, I can't find it. Um, yeah. Yes, number one, I won a prize at school. True or false? False. True. Yeah, True. Yeah. I was that the one... prize? The pen? <laughs> no, well, it was. I won a one pound voucher for Philip's son and nephew in July 75. Um, my mother said, you better spend it on something that could be a keepsake. So I ended up with a yellow Schaefer pen, which I've had for the last 45 years. It's still got the same ink in it. You, know, you don't write your yeah, pen. Yeah, that's the same. Well, put it this way if I drop this, it'll make a dent in the floor. But I won't. <laughs> Schaefer, Schaefer with it as well. Ink. Schaefer, yeah. Number two. <laughs> Two, I once appeared on a very well-known TV quiz show. True false. 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 True. Oh. I was on Mastermind. Really? In yeah. Now, I'll explain a couple of things, Molly. I was actually meant to be on the 8 o'clock recording. For whatever reason, I got there about half six. I went to... Um, it was being recorded at Granada when Granada were just in the process of switching over. It became, what was it, all free media. So the BBC were using the studios as well as ITV. And um, so I go along and I book in. And they say, oh, you're the one who was interested in having a tour around the building. I said, yes, I, I would like that very much. So I went around the building. I was going down to the green room. And an assistant director comes in and goes, oh, thank Christ, you're here, thank Christ, you're here. Why? Well, one short for the seven o'clock recording. I'm, I've just come from Liverpool. Wow. Can we have a cup of tea? No, no, no time. We'll we'll powder you off for shine. So for the one and only time, well, well actually a couple other times, but you wouldn't really want to know. I think Judy knows about them. Um, I had to put some makeup on. And I, believe it or not, I looked You're at still it. wearing it. <laughs> Just powder on my nose because I don't want people we've to... We've got to have a raffle, Dave. We've got to have a whip round to get some money together because these are now. Yes. But you know what it's like? You know, you can't get lipstick on your teeth, you know. You look cheap, you know, things like that. So I actually went into the recording and my nerves went. And I scored against the winner who got about 31 points. I scored nine points. I was absolutely hopeless. What was your specialised my... subject, Andy? The yeah. life and work of the playwright Joe Orton. Really? My dad, my dad, yeah. 
Well, Dad actually said to me, son, you should have chosen something you knew something about. Dad, do you remember when I got a prize in sixth form for um, public speaking? Yeah. Do you remember what the subject was, Dad? No. I said, the life and works of Joe Orton. I said, I knew about this at age 16. So, you know, I don't know why you're saying that. I think my dad felt more embarrassed about it. I mean, I was embarrassed. But then it gets even better because John Humphreys didn't speak to anyone else out of the whole because there was one smart aleck who worked for Sarchi and Sarchi, who proving the great intellectual heavyweight he was, answered questions on Chelsea Football Club, um, you know, and had an extremely well-developed right arm. That's a male joke, by the way. I can't explain that too much. Uh, but it, it ended up where John Humphreys was talking to me for quite a, a length of time. I said, go, what, what you got that we haven't got? I said, well, I don't know. Well, I was going to say, actually, I'm nicer than you. Um, but yes, I was on Mastermind. And it's all a construct. The floor's hollow. There's contact mics. So when you hear noise, it's like very noisy. And it's a, the studio is almost completely dampened. So when you, you see people walk, all you're hearing is the sound from where they're walking across this stage. Third question. Which right. band do you try to join? <laughs> Which band was I going to join? Right. Any ideas? Do you want to guess a band? or do We you have a period. 1981. OMG. Kajigoo. 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 No, <laughs> it wasn't quite like that. No, it wasn't Kajigoo. Spice Girls. <laughs> old and brilliant. What was I, Old Spice? <laughs> um, no. Go on, Michelle, you have a guess. OMD. No, no, it wasn't OMD. Although you're close, it was a Liverpool band. You're giving the game away that you're from Liverpool and they won't let you out the city boundary walls now. I actually wasn't born in Liverpool, I was born in Lancashire. Well, true. we all were. <laughs> well, Liverpool was in Lancashire, <laughs> so that's that's no, true. No. All the same. Herbie was not part of Lancashire until 1974. So, oh. no, I'll tell you what it was. It was China Crisis. Um, really? Yeah. They shouldn't What's have that? dropped those plates. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, I want to take a walk around your very surreal labyrinth of a mind. It was. It was all because you'll need a few. If you need a few malts before you do that, it seems how it's Ben's night. <laughs> Now, just just before we actually get started properly, yeah. our, our so, somnambulist friend has joined us at the bottom of the screen, Andrew, to your, to your left, Mr. I.D.H., Ian D. Hall. Hello. You know what, Ian? Hi, Ian. Now, if yeah. none of you know him, and I, I know that most of you will know him, this guy is to command your immediate respect and love. Um, he is a writer. He's also an author. He's written a number of books, one of which will be launched shortly. <laughs> And he's an author. He's written for Liverpool Sound and Vision for how long now? How long has it been? Nine, now, nine years, Ian, is it? Nine, nine years. Nine years. You see, this this guy um, has promoted a lot of us, including myself. And he said such lovely things about me, which led me to believe that he was reviewing someone else. Uh, <laughs> I I was um, particularly pleased to be part of a night that he found the Casa in May 2019, when it was myself, John Chatterton, and Ellen and Ellie. And as I pointed out at the time, um, <clears throat> to have someone who brings you all together in the same room, that has to have a certain sort of influence on, on you and also shows your influences. Um, and, you know, for that reason, much respect. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> is the reason for us all being here is making oh, I think we're short now. It's nice. Ian, Ian was our guest last Monday, actually. And if you, if you do go onto YouTube and put Beyond Books Media in, you can watch Ian's interview and uh, and and the others we've done. Um, they are going to be edited at some point in the future, which might help get rid of all the bad bits. Just do a five minute show reel, maybe. So mm. part of the idea of this little get together is is to spread the understanding that words have meanings. That whether or not you use them, as Ian Ian did, you know, initially to review other people. It, Ian is a fantastic poet as well. We might we might ask him. To read one of his poems, I'd if love he's got that. any of his poems to hand. So, when, while we're talking in a minute, Ian, would you find one of your poems? Because I'm going to do a bit of Robbie Burns later, but I think you'll be better than me. Take, let me take these first. You're gonna have you're gonna have a, a, oh, a Ian, painkiller. If, yeah. if you read a poem, I'll give you me pen from 1975. How's that? 
Andrew, does it actually still work? Can you prove that pen was worth however much? Yeah, it, it does work. It's yeah. one of those where it's got little. Um, it takes those little platinum cartridges. Yeah. So yeah, it does still work. Yeah, I funnily enough, I I won a prize at school in about 1975, and I'm sure I won a pen as well. <laughs> but I don't think I, I wasn't in school in 75. When, yeah, if, if must be, again. you know, when you finish juniors and move up to seniors, I'm sure I I won a prize. I won a book token one year. Um, so no, the idea is that we we it's to show that words can be used in in different ways. I mean, Ian Ian writes his reviews. He's done like ten thousand reviews in nine years. He's reviewed pretty much anyone who sings, writes, or performs in Liverpool, and anyone basically who visits Liverpool. But he also gets sent to review them all around the place. Um, obviously, uh, my friend Cameron up at the top is is a writer. She writes uh, historical romance sets. I think. Yeah. Uh, 1910 to 1920, Karen, is it, at yeah. the moment? Yeah. Um, Michelle, well, that sounds very appealing. Very, very appealing. That. Well, um, Michelle is a, is a bookseller friend of mine, and obviously Alban at the bottom is a teacher, and Robert uh, Thomas Hardy, a William Shakespeare fan, um, almost anything to do with classical literature, really, Alban. I, I like words, so I like listening in. Yeah, I'm an, um, a, 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 an eavesdropper. I'll, yeah. I'll do I'll do a Burns pro, poem at the end as well, if you like. Oh yeah, well this this, this sounds good. Are you, Andrew, are you going to? Um, have you got a guitar with you? Well, it's funny you should mention that. Yeah. Yo, Dave, pass my one of yours over. Thank you very much, Dave. Yeah, yeah got it. <laughs> so um, no, I was well, just scrolling through. Um, you you've got um, a, a superb SoundCloud dot com. Hashtag Andrew Dash Hesford. And you've got about 70 odd songs on there, haven't you? Well, what it is, is that um, I'm, I'm sorry about this, it sounds a bit hollow because of the, uh, the system. I'll turn it off for a minute. Um, one of the things that happened was that um, I was involved in trying to get some of my own songs down on, on, on tape, well, you know, on the recording. Um, and then I got involved in a production project in which um, Judith was was doing an album and we did a lot of tracks for the album including two which were like a standalone single because i still think in terms of albums and singles and um, which was very enjoyable to do and which involved some quite um off the cuff moments the least of which was um, having the trumpeter come in and play on Blue blueberry hills you remember that judith you remember the trumpeter oh yeah absolutely no it's quite yeah. funny because we were listening to it back it goosebumps it gave us goosebumps it was like um it was like Dixieland trumpet. Um, Martin Smith from the Wizards of Twiddly came in to play it. Um, Dave had been involved in quite a lot of those sessions as well. Um, and I also have done some stuff for myself and also some commissions. Um, there's a commission for doing a song for a ceremonial. I can't say too much about that because the ceremonial has been delayed because of the pandemic. But um, I find it interesting that people come to me now and say, will you do this for... Oh, by the way, could you give us a breakdown of your cost? You know, I'm thinking, I'm not a businessman. Well, I've had to learn to be. Um, and I don't really think of myself in those in terms of that, because you automatically feel, God, I'm only going to ever be able to write something that's half, three and a half minutes long, you know. Um, but the, the stuff that's on SoundCloud is also includes the wall tones, um, which some of which were very enjoyable sessions, because they were not demanding. They were... They were quite a laugh to do, and all of a sudden you find that um, you bounce off each other, and you you find ways of improving the performance, to end up in the live performance. So you think, oh, we never did that before, and we didn't do a lead there, or you didn't do that bass riff there. And yeah. um, so it, I actually enjoy recording. I like the process of it, and also you find that afterwards it's a great excuse to go for a Mackey's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, before I and, and as, as, as <laughs> Dave and Judith know, the, the Riverside Cafe next to Vulcan would go broke if it wasn't for musicians. Yeah, <laughs> because it's always going to have like I'm a. I'm surprised you didn't spend all day there one time instead of going into Vulcan. Something. Do you remember the, So good. I actually had the phone call from Barry and Vulcan saying, "You are coming in, aren't you?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, and Gavin Hayes was there. He had this huge pregnant sandwich. You know, yeah, just tell them a minute. <laughs> <You know. laughs> 
and, and Judith was being ever ever so ladylike, and she's having a, you know, cutting the meal up and, you know, disposing of it properly, you know. And here's me sort of eating like, you know, it was the last meal I would ever have. <laughs> partly because of nerves, but partly because I knew I wouldn't get anything else. The thing, thing is, don't you pay session. by the hour to go into a recording studio? Did this not thought not cross your mind? I know it's a one one cost fits all. Oh, is it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's meant to be a demo studio, but the results are actually comparable to a professional recording studio. Um, and it, it's like I did a recording with a friend of ours who, um, of course, Dave knows and, and Jude knows, called Johnny Larson. It's the one that you heard the other night, Trevor. Uh, you know that version of Reflection they recorded about uh, six years ago? Yeah, you sent me two, two, didn't you? Yeah, there was one that I recorded in November of 13. You were on that session, Dave. And there's the one I recorded in May. Was that the one from the Valley? That's the one from the Valley Community Theatre. But the Valley Community Theatre, while it was very good, there was a lot of um, a lot of time wasted. You know, and I felt that... I think there was more the problem with Guitar Your Dreams that took more time with that. Reflection, oh, I thought, went pretty well. Well, it was one individual who, um, although he's credited Ooh, don't, on it... Don't say it. <laughs> I know. Anyway, I'm sorry about this. Tony, shall we get um, Ian? Yeah, I think... I, well, I feel well, terrible that I've... Don't I've worry, been, don't, don't worry. We're, we're up and running now. So, Andrew, just tell us a little bit about the song you're going to play for us. If we can all mute ourselves, I'll put Andrew on um, speaker view. So, if you can tell us where the idea came from, what it's about, mm. who it's about, etc. And then mm. it's all over to you, Andrew. Right. God, the hard questions first, eh? Um, let me see. Now, this particular one was a song which I did with um, Dave was in the studio, along with our friend Bob Swan and Marco Riola, um, who's an Italian guitarist of some renown. And... It was in September of 2017 we recorded this. And because we rehearsed it and rehearsed it, it, it turned out it was actually quite a good session. And it was very, very quick. So I'm trying to remember it myself now. Here we go. That proves it's totally live. Okay. You know what? I've forgotten the words. Sorry. Nerves do that to you. Right. Oh, dear. You know, I can't think of the first two words. The world turned out this blue. Couldn't see how to find again the better part of you. Only a moment ago. I think I'll do something else because I cannot remember the first word. Let's do something else. Good you okay? Watercolor. Go around, Andrew. Watercolor. Watercolor? Yeah, we well, only picked you to do that. Okay. I've got to think of how it goes. Huh? I actually had the idea on Valentine's Day 2018 and um, I went to Judas. I had these words and said, what do you think is there's something in this? And so due to fact that as the scribe, as I'm saying, right, that word goes there. No, don't go in order, no, go in this order. So the two of us were actually bouncing off it. It became, let's just have a cup of coffee and calm down. And eventually... I walk with you into a meadow Sun was high in the sky we were starry-eyed and laughing, not a cloud went by. Then the rains came, watched the sun away, didn't have a coat to wear. Then we laughed into a shelter, I noticed your blonde hair. I looked into your blue eyes, saw the sun once again. The memory seemed to be ours alone, preserved within our frame. So beautiful and far away. The memory will linger 
as the years go on. So beautiful, far away, close my eyes and wonder where you've gone. Love we may not still remember as the years grow on. That's what happens when you get nervous, you forget. It's easy done, isn't it? It's easy yeah. done. That was lovely, though. Funnily enough, I was listening to some of your songs today, and if you didn't sing Watercolours, I was going to suggest that we played that one off your sound. <laughs> well, do you know what inspired it? This is what we yeah. wanted. It was, it was a memory from when I was younger. Yeah. Right. And it was also, um, it was based on, I couldn't remember at the time, and I did actually say to Judah, I couldn't remember it was Shazano or Monet, there's a painting that looks like it's made up of like different elements of brush strokes or whatever. Sorry, I'm getting a bit of feedback. Um, and I, I couldn't think of who painted it, but it's like a woman with an umbrella. But it was laid up of all these elements of like sort of almost like spun brush strokes. And I remember thinking to myself, I, I thought watercolor, that's a lovely name for a song. I didn't know anyone else who used it at that time. And there were a couple of phrases that came to mind. But the song refers to the moment seems to be ours alone, preserved within a frame, which I don't think I remember the line. And um, there were there were various things which paint a picture of what you saw. So it's it's about romantic love, which drives a lot of the, the lyrics I write. You know, I'm not in love with love, you know, so much as in love with the ideal of being in love, you know. And well, isn't that called limerence? It may actually have other phrases to describe it. Um, some women would describe it as um, the man was a dreamer or a bloody fool. Um, some would actually say that you need to get your head out the clouds and get on with doing a job of work. You know, you've got 60, you know, custard slices to ice before 11 o'clock or something like that. They'd actually pull you back to thinking about what things are on the normal level. But do you not think that that lovely sort of dreamlike state is what makes poets songwriters writers authors it, it oh, is yes. the ability to to take dreams and and make them a version of reality for yourself let alone anyone who interacts yes, with them i think I that, mean, that's as, it isn't it it as as we already said i mean like it was mentioned about romantic novels i've often thought that um these are things which are soft focus however but it, it's nice it's 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 escapist. I mean, people knock Mills and Boom books because they see them as rather a kind of clean version of a yellow book. It was like, sort of a Mills and Boom book is just meant to make you think about things in soft focus. And the man is always tall and handsome and looks like Colin Firth. And the woman is always um, petite and has a, a sort of English rose complexion. Um, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that if it appeals to, to people. I mean, I, I can't say I've ever read a Mills and Boom book. They, they have different styles, you know. They, they, I mean, they obviously have the traditional historical romance ones. Then they have the, the, you know, the ones you're talking about, the contemporary ones. But they also do some that are quite racy these days, you know. Oh, there's a lot of there's a lot of what you're thinking of as a kind of vaguely bodice ripper. Type well, thing. well, I think some of them are a little bit more. Um, in, in, intriguing than that anyway just before we um go back to another song off you andrew we, yes, we sure. did drop we did drop a, a polite request to ian below oh please to, um, i love hearing ian stuff i think poetry is something that sort of suits a sort of book chat words chat really because um it I, I don't think enough people do enough poetry people often say they don't like poetry and i often think well which poems have you read? Which poems have you listened to? You know, listen to Radio 4. They have a whole half hour with Roger McGough and people. If you can't enjoy that, well, there's something wrong with your head. <laughs> and really? about Ian, Ian, I think. Some songs are formed from poetry. Exactly, exactly. I think Ian, Ian and myself and Alban are all Roger McGough fans anyway. So uh, I don't know if Ian, me in on that. If Ian's going to do a, a humorous one. or What, what are you going to do for us, Ian? 
I don't really do. I'm, I'm not a very funny man. <laughs> <laughs> but that not sounded really almost that like it. It sounded almost like a Tommy Cooper line. I'm not a very funny man. <laughs> well, I'm not. <laughs> um, I've got. I've got to be in the mood to do humour. Yeah. And I certainly can't write him. It's more of, I think, if I ever come up with anything funny, it's only <sighs> misguided sarcasm, usually. <laughs> it's probably the best way to... More Spike Milligan and, and Harry yeah. Seacom, really. <laughs> but a lot more Hancock half hour than yeah. carry on, yeah. <laughs> um, I could... I can do something that sort of ties in with. Um, sorry, you'll have to forgive me. I've t- I've had to take a lot of painkillers today, so right, if I come across as if I come across as being bored, then that's the reason why. Um, but I can do one that sort of I haven't practiced it at all, but it can fit in with what we were talking about last week. Yeah. Um, I think obviously Alvin was there and Andrew was there. Um, but I was talk- we were talking about the um, uh, the graffiti on the on the road in Malta. Oh yeah, yeah. And this would be I'm going to have to do it this way. Sorry, bear with me. Um, it's called in response to a howl in St Julian's Bay. I saw your words etched down in spray paint. Bold capital letters on a rising pavement. In St. Julian's Bay, as the sun would start to glisten on the Valletta streets and the Isle of Kimono would begin to soon heave to the sound of vendors selling deck chairs and the sea would spoil for a fight. I saw your words and was puzzled by them. Not, Not by the words, for even the damaged can understand pain. By their placement, their specific duty in time, by an unknown hand who obviously was a person of much discerning taste, not the normal Kilroy was here, or such words of illiterate affection and fulsome in praise of destruction, but to outline that even here on my paradise found, the howl of torture could be an earnest sort. I challenged the unseen hand. I raged for a moment, despite its ominous beauty, which has held me in an embrace since I first learned of its existence, and respected the shuffling beard and stooped-down approach. I raged inwardly. Show your hand. The placing of such anguished words in a place where the sun captures the essence of the soul. I raged for all the three seconds. I reached because I had forgotten in one day that pain exists and its sufferers are everywhere. The response to that howl in an unexpected place was such that my stomach tightened, constricted and stiffened. I had forgotten that pain exists by sitting in a quietness afforded to me in the simplicity of island life. I hated myself for new and wished to hold the painter of realism on concrete canvas close to me and beg for forgiveness, which was not mine to deserve. My response to seeing your words in an unexpected place reminds me that the howl is never won, nor wooed, just misplaced when it suits us. Thank you. Very, very much. So very good. That's okay. I was just expecting to sit there quietly all night. Well, you really can now. No. You, you've done your honorary bit of. Uh, no, it, thank it, you. I just thought, obviously, you being a poet, rather than uh, trying to make out. Well, I mean, Andrew's welcome to read a poem if he wants, but and everyone else might not realise. You know, if if you join us again, find a poem that might sort of suit the day or suit the mood, because I think people sharing a poem is. Uh, something we, we we should do more of you know you know do it on your own facebook wall or i mean michelle i don't know you're you're more twitter than facebook aren't you i think um 
you know, but, you know, there's so much can be said with so few words. And I think, like David said a minute ago, it, poetry is basically what leads into songs anyway. You know, if you don't have rhyme and metaphor and, and meaning, in a way, you, you, you just have, like, um, a chorus and, ch and chant. And, you know, I think real quality songwriters like Andrew go way beyond just that very simplistic... Um, you know, chorus with with a, a few other words thrown in. So, Andrew, you you're quite political. I I think I was listening to um, a song you wrote, really really like actually. And if you're not going to play it, I'll play it out through the. Um, what one was it, by the way? About the, the Dockers. Oh, that was the commission. Yeah. Um, so tell us I, all about that because you oh, can either play it live or I'll play it out through the. Um, sound it might track. be better if you play it out. It, it's yeah. in fact it was one that. Um, for once, I didn't actually play an instrument on it um, okay. because we changed it quite a lot in the recording. And I thought, well, I know the words, but we were changing the words. So it ended up where certain words didn't fit or certain phrases. Um, but what it was, was I was asked by a guy called Terry McGoonagall, who is a sculptor. And he has an atelier in Italy. And he also goes to all the places to actually get stone and marble. To make things, he's very much into the um, classic um, Grecian or Roman styles of, of sculpting. And he was asked to do a, a sculpture to go at the entrance of the Bramley Mall Dock Everton Stadium. And the idea would be to um, honour the, the kind of maritime role that Bramley Mall Dock had played in, in terms of something that Everton would do. Um, and after all, a lot of... Um, Dockers were Liverpoolian or Evertonian. And he said, What I want is I want a song that's actually sort of um, suitable for this. And I came up with something and, um, which was called Here's to the Dockers. And I was trying to describe about the type of life they lived and about the um, troubles they served. I mean, I never thought it was political. I can kind of see where you're coming from, Tony. Um, but my way of looking on it was that it was actually my tribute because I had some relatives who were dockers as well and the the names for them because of, of the misdemeanors they committed um like two Bob Robbers referred to in the song you've heard of diesel bitter do we need shall I explain some of these I mean, there may be yeah, some go on. Give, give us a bit yeah. of an explanation yeah okay some of the names that dockers gave to their mates the submarine man if you want me lads I'll be down below <laughs> in other words, I'll be out of sight of any work. Um, diesel fitter. This is the one that would break open cases of clothes. Very important. Goes diesel fitter, diesel fitter, <laughs> referring to the wife. Um, my favourite was two Bob Rob. Two Bob Rob is somebody who go, hey mate, so you got two Bob. Right. Oh, I need me bus fare. Oh, oh I need me me butty at lunchtime. So they'd, you say, where you are? Or for that matter, they wouldn't give them two Bob at all. Now, it didn't matter that his name wasn't Rob, because if he didn't get the two Bob, he'd go, hang back a minute, I'm just looking for me ciggies. And he'd go for the coats and eventually take money out of the coats. So it'd be two Bob Rob, he'd have a Rob two Bob or get two Bob. Uh, told you it was complex. Um, but, you know, there were some amazing names. There was somebody who said, I don't want any nicknames, lads, leave me alone. You know, don't want any nicknames. So what they did was they called him Clint Eastwood, man with no name. <laughs> um, it's like that. So there were all these amazing sorts of stories, but added to that, they were very, um, very hardy people, you know. And there were sometimes that a lot of them were killed during the Second World War, not only in Liverpool but elsewhere. I mean, especially in the south of England, where the likes of um, some of the docks were absolutely bombed into non-existence. And it was presented by Terry to the. The Liverpool Dock Workers Association, and he said it's a bit long, aren't it? And he went, "What do you mean?" And the song is probably about four minutes. I can't remember what it is, but I know in order to get all that story and I had to include all those verses, I, I will have to go in uh, with Gary and Balkan and probably do an edit. But there were enough sort of um, reasonable tenets and pauses within that song I could do it. So, but so if, have you found it yet, by the way, Tony? Yeah, no, I've got it ready. I've I, 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 I yeah. been vaguely organised for once, um, he says. No, please go ahead. Anyway, 
you, you can play that. I mean, I'm sorry I can't play it for you tonight, but to be honest, yeah. it is quite a long song. And also, although I wrote it, it's not a damn favourite, if that's not a bad way of putting it. Well, I mean, we'll, we'll just, what we're going to do is just play like the first two minutes or so, so people get a, a feel for this. From scores of places around the world to the heart of your hometown. Maritime goods were traded, winched up, lowered down. Known to those who love them, working through all weathers. Who always worked and seldom spoke, and always stuck together. Days were long and life was short, the darker still grafted away. No rest for these tough workers, much less allow for play. Pig eye wine, cotton tea, tobacco, rice and grain. Material from everywhere, delivered and brought ashore again. Throughout our city's history, these brave and tough, hardy men kept wheels of trade turning time and again. Bad times they help to bring us through Here to the dockers We won't forget you In the poorest conditions Tough men stay With their arduous task Casual laborers Gather the dark gates Only there to ask If any work was going even for a few hours a day And for very little money They'd be happy to strive away Many characters worked in these places Reputations known Baldy rabbit, diesel fitter The cover never blown Submarine man and bad man's mate Too abrupt to name a few Rough human lads always smiling with so much work to do Throughout our city's history These brave and tough hardy men Kept wheels of trade mm. so who, who was Batman's mate and, and the rabbit? <laughs> oh, right, the baldy rabbit refers to somebody Who comes up to you just before hometown Goes, can you lend me some money? I've lost me fear That's where that comes from uh, Batman's mate describes somebody who was life fingered. He's always robbing. Ah, <laughs> that's where ah. it comes from. So all these things are like an internal logical joke in them. And typical of Dockers, there was a nickname for everybody. I mean, that's why when I, I remember watching a thing called uh, the Dustbin Men. Do any of you remember that? And the Dustbin Men, they always had names for people, like, um, for example, Cheese and Egg, which referred to the 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 boss gaffer who always wore a hat with braid on it, you know, like gold braid. So he used to say, he's got cheese and egg on that, his hat. Um, and things like that. Is that... What was it? Sorry. Excuse me a moment. Uh, live phone call. <laughs> oh, it's, it's uh, house phone, say, but... sorry. Andrew, do you need to take it and we'll we'll chat while you grab it? Or are you okay? No, it's okay. It's, it's okay. What's the dispute then, Edward Woodward? Andre, sorry. sorry, it was the dustbin men, Edward Woodward. Edward Woodward. Wood. No, no, it Edward Woodward. Was, um, <laughs> no, no. Brian Pringle. Oh, Brian no. And, um, I seem to recall Edward Woodward. Wood. It was the uh, dustbin men. Yeah. I'm um, the dustbin men. <laughs> um, but it, it, they always had nicknames for people, and I always fascinated. Because in work, um, as you all know, I've just retired. And we had um, two ladies, Carol, Carol Lace, to give her a full name, and Karen Rigby. Now, Rigby got called Riggers, which sounded a bit vaguely rude to some people. But I ended up where I coined the best nickname of all because we were always together. So I called them Cagsy and Lacey, <laughs> as in Karen and Carol Lace, Cagsy and Lacey, um, which suited, actually, because if you'd seen them, they, they didn't look unlike Cagsy, Cagney and Lacey. But... Um, I ended up where I, I got called for some reason the, the blue tornado because I wore a blue uniform. Um, you, you know, I was always rushing around to the goal. Oh, the blue tornado. 
Andrew worked in in local hospital. <laughs> Um, Alban, you, you mentioned really? you, you would kindly do some Rabbi Burns for us. I, yes, I, I, I found one if you want it. The advantage of you doing it is I only yes, have please. to do the last verse of one that I was going to do because right. you'll probably be good enough to do the whole piece. So, uh, you know, I think we should celebrate Robbie Burns because, I mean, you know, it, it's he's Absolutely. such an icon. I mean, he, I mean, he created Old Lang Syne. I think that's probably yeah. the one that most people know in in relation to him um but he he was quite a wordsmith really wasn't he Alburn? and uh, oh absolutely you know and, and take with it yeah but quite profound as well really i mean and revolutionary yeah so what what do tell us what one you're going to do and we'll put you well I, 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 I was hoping you'd let me go first rather than second because i thought you might steal this, this no one. no well that's the point we're letting you do it piece yeah I, I used to do it as a party piece the, the, the scots were here we wallace bled uh, if there are any real Scotsmen out there, I do apologise for it. make your ears bleed. But um, when well, I used to, to the Scottish. Oh, well, I, I apologise to them then. Um, my dad was. Oh up... no, well, it should be all right. <laughs> right. Whenever I used to go up to to Scotland with, with the children, it was um, they'd always tell me when we got over the border, stop speaking Scottish because somebody will come up and hit you. <laughs> anyway, you may know this one, but if, if you don't, I'll introduce it, and. Um, uh, it, it's called Scots Were Here with Wallace Blair, and it's supposed to be the words of Robert the Bruce uh, before the Battle of uh, Bannockburn in 1314, when Edward II was sent home uh, to, to look for his poker. So this is uh, Scots Were Here uh, by Robbie Burns, and it's, it's trying to ra raise his army up, ready to, uh, to fight the English. Scots Were Here with Wallace Blair, Scots Were Bruce has often led. Welcome to your gory bed, utter victory. Now's the day and now's the hour. See the front of battle lower. See approach proud Edward's power, chains and slavery. War will be a traitor knave. War can fill a coward's grave. War say bases be a slave. Let him turn and flee. War for Scotland, king and lord, freeman's sword will freely draw. Freeman stand or Freeman fall, let him follow me. By oppressions, woes and pains, by your sons in servile chains, we will drain our dearest veins, but they shall be free. Lay the proud usurpers low, tyrants fall in every foe, liberties in every blow, let us do or a day. That's Robbie Burns. <laughs> Yep, I must admit, I must admit. I mean, you gave that meaning to weight and meaning. You know, that that's the the one thing about um, you know, some of the Scottish poetry of Robbie Burns. I mean, most people know things like "My Love Is Like a Red Red Rose," <clears throat> and I some know some of the more um, histrionic things like um, "The Day Is Away with the Eyesman." <clears throat> you know, which is actually you know, every time I've heard it, I think there was a I can't remember the name of the guy who actually recorded them. William McCaspinall or someone like that who actually recorded an LP of Robbie Byrne songs, um, which my sister had when I was a kid. And so it ended up where every 25th of January she'd play that. I've been trying to find a copy in the last few weeks, actually. I'm the I, singer, I sorry, the singer with Fairground Attraction brought out... Um, I Pond Kiss. Kiss. Eddie Vida, is it? Ed Eddie Vida, yeah. Eddie Vida, yes, he did. Um, I Pond Kiss. Yeah. I mean, I, I was a big Corrie's fan, and, and they always sang that. Scots yeah. Way. But it's it's one of those where you feel, it, you know, it's it. it we were mentioning the title. Of this, of course, is music. You know, so words with meaning, or words with a meaning. And words can have a weight as well as a meaning. And if you think about the, the way in which that poem should be read, it's it's actually like a a cry, a battle cry. Mm. You know, let's go and get the English. You know, basically. <laughs> And he did. I, I quite like it. <laughs> yeah, I, I've always loved stuff like that. Well, but, I mean, I'm trying to be uh, too pretentious. I mean, English one of one of my uh, was my one of my academic subjects. But same here. Burns was a bit of um, a double uh, identity sort of thing. You know, a, a romantic poet writing in English, and then um, a native Scots writer as well 
and uh, he, he he managed to carry off that game very well yeah. indeed. But you could argue that what he was trying to do was he was trying to um, get across to as many people as possible in the modern day sense. That'd be like a songwriter who wrote in one style, but he'd write in other styles to attract a different audience. In, I mean, it's it's hard to believe sometimes that. I mean, I'm, I'm not quoting this because I'm a fan. But say Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift is regarded mainly as someone who appeals to young people, but she's done folk and country. She's done dance music and all sorts. And so what she's done is she's ended up as quite a broad church artist who can appeal to a lot of people. I mean, I, I wouldn't say I've got a Taylor Swift album. I'm not exactly snooing over with Taylor Smith. Ian Swift and album. I are reviewing one, aren't we, Ian? As soon as I can, yes. But yeah. I have reviewed her in the past. She's very, I actually like her. She's very good. And she's good. Yeah. I think she's doing a, a, an album of Metallica covers as well. Well, that in itself is quite a, an interesting thing. It's nearly as good as Lou Reed playing with Metallica. You know, I mean, I'd, I'd like to sort of know whether that would have gone any further if he'd lived. So, you Andrew, know. just just one other thing. I'm, I'm trying to remember something that came up when we were talking last week. You've written, am I right in thinking you've written scripts? Yes. For ra radio. And are, are they still in, in preparation? Are they going oh, somewhere? There's... There is there is one thing in preparation. I mean, I've written one thing which um, was actually my take on a dating agency. But you know where people do dating agencies in all virtual? And it's always like sort of the hair smooth down the shed. Hi, you know, hi, I'm Richard. <laughs> oh, I'm cute and cuddly. I really, really like this. And you know the type of thing that makes you want to go, oh, really be sick? And I thought... What would happen if you had virtual dating, where all it was, was everything was virtual, it's computers talking to each other. So during the night, while we're all asleep, these computers are getting off with each other. A bit of artificial intelligence going on. You know, In some ways, that's I, almost I, become reality now. Yeah, but the fact is, is when you wake up in the morning and find you've got three Minimax near your computer, Dave, you know that they've had a good night. Um, <laughs> Minimax? That sounds like a, that sounds like something going into going on in McDonald's. <laughs> no, no, I'm thinking of Apple Minimax. Um, but, you know, imagine it. You know, I just want your fries with that. Yeah, you know, it sounds bizarre as an idea. Um, but I, I thought there must be some legs in that. And another thing was about... Um, I realised it was too close to a plot of a book. It was about the same girl at different times of life um, and meeting the same people, but in different ways and different forms. And I thought, I know this. And I wrote down quite a lot on a few notes, connective notes for it. And then I realised, I'd, I'd remembered vaguely Maggie Tulliver from The Mill on the Floss. And the, her life is affected by her brother, a mother, and a, and a father and all these other people but it's the same girl but if you like treated with sort of varying degrees of respect or disrespect all her life battered and, from pillar uh, to post really isn't she what were you saying Alvin? I'm just saying she, she's battered from pillar to post absolutely but the reason why I was trying to think about it is, is that I was trying to think about one person you know where the background around them changes and the environment around them changes but Basically, everybody is like sort of, it's like being a fish. Instead of shedding scales, you gather them. You know, every time something happens, it's like you someone's hung another scale on you. And eventually you're walking around with this, you know, suit of scales to weigh you down, you know, which is basically life, isn't it? That's I thought really there was an idea, idea in there. That's a really good um, allegory, that though, isn't it? Um, are you gonna, have you got another song you could do for us? Are yes, you, as a matter of fact, I have. <laughs> Now, now you, now you've calmed down, and you, you know that everyone's happy to have you here. <laughs> oh, it's, it, it's, it's not an ego thing because if it was ego driving this. I would have an entirely different life. Um, I've always thought that it's trying to get your point across or trying to get your words across to people. Now, this requires a bit of explanation. In the July of 2016, July the 22nd, something happened to one of our friends in this square, Judith. Do you remember? Well, it, it was when... A lot of things happen. 
Uh, 16 four, oh, five remember? years ago, four and a half years ago. It was about uh, the car. It was the car. It? Is it about my little car? car? Yes, that's right. Oh, yeah. Do you remember what happened? Mm. I took it to the garage to get a, um, oh, just a small job done. And the guy said, I've known him for like 23 years. And the guy said to me, I'll ring you when it's ready. So I phoned Andrew and I said, I put the power in because he was nagging me to get this thing. Um, going through the tunnel, it used to echo this noise every now and again. Anyway, it's on the, the what do you call them? The lift thing in the, in the garage. Hoist. And hoist. I, I hoist, yeah. I went outside. And the guy that owns the garage came out with me to wait for a taxi for me. And... And that was about two minutes after I phoned Andrew. I phoned the taxi and I phoned Andrew. And it was about half past 10 in the morning. So I went on shopping in Birkenhead, got a taxi back home. And Larry, the garage owner, always phones me when my car's ready. And he said to me, I'll phone you about lunchtime. Anyway, I got busy with things at home. And it was three o'clock. And I thought, he hasn't phoned me about the car. And I ain't been without a car. So um, I, I rang him, and his first words were, I've got some terrible news for you. And I thought, oh, God, somebody's died or something like that. And I said, what's happened? And he said, your car's burned out. Somebody came in, allegedly turned on a oxy torch, and there was a can of petrol right beside it where he turned it on. And my car being on the hoist, it was right under the car. Everything just went up in smoke. So I was quite sad. I looked at that little car. It was easy to a bigger one, but this little one was easy to park everywhere. And, and that night, I'm sitting here watching Kelly or something, and Andrew rings. He says, what do you think of this song? And it's like a song in memory of my car. And I can't believe it's four years ago that that happened. Flipping out. But you remember... You, you were feeling a bit vulnerable and, and also quite upset. And it's me, I've got this great idea for a song. I knew exactly what time it was because of calls on my phone um, to the taxi and to the um, and to Andrew to tell him, the car's in, it's okay, it's going to get fixed, right? Five minutes later, I'm getting in a taxi and the guy didn't tell me until three o'clock when I rang up. And he said, haven't you had the television on? It's been top news all over the place. Well, I'm, I don't know what I was doing. I was, must have been interested in something anyway. And uh, I said, no, I, I got a shock. He said, oh, he said, the whole place is burnt out. And it's only just been rebuilt, actually. But my car, I went to see it about three months later, and it was just a shell. Worst thing was, I just put a full tank of petrol in it the night before. <laughs> That's probably why it, it took off at a, at a rate of knots. And I lost one of my favourite... Um, CDs in there as well. That was actually the CD player. But anyway, um, it got another one, so it's fine. But I do miss that little car. So this song is in remembrance of. It could have been called the Blue Get. That's what it was. I'll I'll tell you about the session after we've done this. I'm sorry about the feedback, folks. Are you all right with that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
The only problem was some of them stayed on mute when they were doing backing vocals. The world wouldn't be. That, we, 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 we should have to do it all again so we can join in, you see. <laughs> I, I've I'm heard of myself sing. I, I, you, you know what I mean? I'm well, to put this way, Ian, I'll tell you what was strange. In school, um, I wasn't allowed to sing because I couldn't get the voice because of my asthma. So I must be the only kid who ever got sent to do extra Latin. Rather than sing, and um, so I, I know all these oh, like funny. stupid Latin rhymes. There was a, a teacher we had called Sally. This is true. This Mr. Sally, who was our Latin teacher before they took it off the curriculum. And Mr. Sally used to get skittered unmercifully by all of us. So it was um, Sally was his nickname. Sallius Satius on the deskiorum, deskius Calatius, Sally on the floorum. That's how good I remember. It. <laughs> I, I so, think I'd rather have had the old chalkboard the racist uh, they never to speak now. <laughs> you see what it comes down to is um, education. You mentioned about English literature there, Trev. Education feeds into a lot of things you do. And you find there's some things that are like for me, and like for example, um, I'm always interested in where people get unusual words in songs. Like, I remember Kate Bush included the word pseudonym in a song. I think it was in Babushka. Um, and mm. um, what was the one that was included in a monkey song? Michael Nesmith wrote a song called Daily Nightly. And Prison is in that song. And he said, you can't write songs like that. You can't include words on it. Yeah, you can. All the words are available. It's just the context you need to get it right, you know. Um, but, I mean, I, I think that a lot of things can inform how you, you write. And also, sometimes it can remind you of something else unintentionally. But I, I actually find that uh, I enjoy certain things. Uh, the dream I have of you was actually written largely on the um, Tascam, which I've got to my left here, um, on my Porter studio. And it was like I put a, a drum beat through, put a bass track on it, and uh, put some guitar stabs, you know, like rim guitar stabs on it. And I, I basically strung it together from that. And then my friend, Bob Swan, rang up and said, what are you doing? 
And in fact, that's at that point when we called you, Judith, because, you know, most people bring in a specialist plumber. I brought in Bob to play some harmonica on it. Um, so it ended up where by the time I got to Saturday, it was a finished demo. And then the recording wasn't quite the country song we wanted. It was a rock thing and it was bloody loud. And we played it in Vale um, Park. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that was yeah, an example of where... The whole park rocking you were there, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. do, you remember, do you remember that? I remember that as being particularly... I thought, it's great when an idea of yours has a appeal. Just you know, one thing. I'm, there's nothing... I'm, something that just came up in that conversation then. The one thing you must miss the most at the moment is being able to stand up in a place and perform a song or, or tell a story. Oh, and, absolutely. And, I mean, you know, when was the last you feel, time you performed? You feel stars. When was the last time you performed live? Um, it was. Um, actually, the, the last proper gig was, in fact, January last year, when well, I went to the Rock go. and Roll Society at um, Old Swan Community Club. In fact, you were there, Judith. Yeah, because yeah, Judith's one people. We've only had about four other. nights open since then. Six yeah. nights, maybe. But... But there was an unofficial one, which Dave and I know about. I'd gone for a radio interview with um, John Hall to um, Liverpool Live, and we were interviewed by um, John Jessup. It was primarily to host me, but I wanted John on it because sometimes doing these things on your own, it, it's a bit flat. You need you need someone else to shiver you up a bit. Partner in crime. And, uh, <laughs> Partner in crime, yeah. And, uh, well, you're in the same <laughs> position as, as as John's, really. You're my you're my go-to person for being a partner in crime. It's just you out where that day. And anyway, I said to Dave, if you're free, come to the Baltic Fleet. So we took the guitars and ourselves to the Baltic Fleet. Me and John, we had a we had um, a couple of pints of Guinness, and then we had um, some scouts because of course you can only serve your food with drinks. You can't just have drinks. And Dave came in. And the next thing, we ended up where I was intended to go home at like six. And we were there until about half eight, entertaining the pub. <laughs> that was great, that. That was a great night, that. That was two nights before Christmas Eve. And it was, it, it's like, what you realise is, if you're born to do it, you're born to do it. You, you love doing it. I, I, we entertained probably maybe half a dozen people, but it was great. It was great to be there. Sometimes that's yeah. the thing. I mean, we, we used to, I mean, it, it, Ian and Alban and, and I have all done poetry nights in the past and you sometimes panic thinking how many people are going to come but as long as anyone comes and you can share something you know i'll read a poem you read a poem i had one once in the bookshop when i had my shop there were only three of us and i i don't write a lot of poetry but i like poetry so i, I love hearing other people's and reading it i do write a little bit but we we spent two hours in in a in a in a closed bookshop and it was cold we didn't even have the heating on and we just went round in a circle either you know coming up with something or reading something someone had written or you know responding to what they've written by trying to come up with something else and we had a wonderful time a bit like you'd do a songwriter's circle really um, well I'd, I'd love to do something on the nashville sort of model of what do you call a guitar pull i, I think Trevor might know what I mean on this. I'm certain you do. Um, a guitar pull is like an open mic night, but what you do is you have one guitar, you all sit in a circle and you say, right, do the song that's closest to you or close to your heart. And that's the first run. The second one is do your favourite um, own song. And that's the second run. And the third one might be um, do a song with a girl's name in it. And the, the suggestion is you constantly have to think. So by the time it gets to you, you think, right, I'll do where it might be. Um and I'd love to do something like that, you know, in the traditional sense of a Nashville guitar pull. What's your thoughts on that, Trev? Well, funnily enough, um, for a short while, there was um, like an acoustic circle at the uh, Wallaceans Club. Um, not like that, but we sat around in a circle and people did instrumentals or local songwriters played stuff. Um, and... When we organised it, um, the committee said, yes, well, we've put it round, we're going to be an audience. But in the end, there were more players than audience. So it was treated out. And of course, the, the Wallasey Folk and Acoustic Club moved out from there. Uh, and they went to the Spire in, in Breck Road, um, 
corner of Mill Lane. Um, that's the problem. But the venues don't work out. I think before before the Wallaceans, they were at the uh, the Nelson in Grove Road, and the Nelson at short notice would uh, bring in a wedding party or or something like that. That's got to take precedence for the village, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, just okay. before we um we we let Andrew do another song, I think Ian, have you got to um dip dip out and and uh, do do other things? Were you just saying a minute ago? I'm not going to do other things. I've got to go and lie down. <laughs> Ian, it's always a pleasure it's, to it's, see you, sir. It, next door, I've been all day. It's been relentless today with the noise, oh. and it's just got to a point of. I can knock on the door for assistance and say, can "You please stop this because I've had enough." <laughs> oh, I'm that... gonna have. I'm gonna have to go and lie down a bit. Yeah, no, it sounds sounds like a bit of a rest will do you good, mate. Just just get hold of me in the morning, re anything that needs picking up. Anyway, yeah, yeah. no worries. Thank, Thank you. Lovely to see you all. Thank Thank you. Take care. Thanks, 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 Ian. Bye. 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 Cheers, mate. So, Andrew, I, he's I, gone. Let's talk about them. Yeah, that's oh, it. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> no, we couldn't do that. We couldn't do that. He's a very no, nice no, man. Never. But um, do check Ian's website out, folks, if you don't already know it. Just put in Liverpool Sound and Vision, and he reviews so much stuff. But he writes some of his poetry is amazing. I mean, Andrew knows quite a lot of it, and we're hoping in the not too distant future, you know. A bit more is going to be done with his poetry, aren't we? Really, it's uh, yeah. We've got a little ambition that we've got is let's get the word out that Ian's a, a good guy, really. So we'll come back to that. That's just a, a thought process at the moment. Yeah, we, we we can't say too much, but Dan will tell. You know. Yeah. Um, how much time have we got, by the uh, way? We've got about five Sorry. minutes, mate. So if we if okay. we can do another uh, song and then. Um, you know, if anyone okay. else can wants I... to ask anything or say anything, we'll, we'll, we'll be okay. I'll tell you what, I'd, I'd like a, a brief Q&A, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. You know, if anyone who wants to ask me anything, you know, I don't mind whatever question you ask, I'm very open-minded. Who are the oh, people yeah. on the wall? <laughs> the people on the wall, that's the Beatles. You right, know, okay. that picture. Yeah. That's the Beatles anthology. Right, Okay. But, and but who I mean, are the people on the wall behind I mean, Tony? Ah, that is Ian ah, and, that's... and Andrew and Judith. Um, and well, Judith. I, I used to do um, a live music show at Holden Radio. Oh, I had short hair then. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, so every, every Sunday I'd have some someone. Ian would know so many musicians like Andrew. So every Sunday night, 8 till 10, would have a, a guest in. And they'd do a live session, a bit a bit like this has been. But with it being radio itself, it was structured more that would let more more songs go out, really. Um, and I used to do a book show on a Sunday morning with a, a friend of mine, Sally Ann. Uh, so that was a long day. We did three hours about books Sunday morning and then go home and freshen up and then go back and do a two-hour live music show on a Sunday. But it was great fun. Um, but we are starting one fairly soon. The logo, the other side of me, the ANW one, is Access Northwest. And they're a, an online radio station in Liverpool. And they're, they're looking at expanding the, their live shows when when we can get into the studio. So we're, we're going to do one that's 50-50 books and poetry, 50-50 singer-songwriter, you know, you know, an alternate, really. Um, so, you know, people like Karen and Michelle that are more book friends would come one week and, and you know, join in. And then the second week, people who are a bit more, you know, poetry and songs would come along. So it, it it's due to start as soon as we can access the studio, really. Because um, you've got to clean everything down, haven't you, really? So, Michelle, you, you should ask a question. There must be something you want to ask someone who plays with words, as you sell them all day. <laughs> well, it was actually, I wanted to know when he first picked up the guitar, when, how old were you? Oh, God. I, I, I actually was interviewed for this by, um, you know, Lewis William McElliot, you know, for um, uh, The Last Stop, you know, which was a website. I actually first got a guitar in 1972. 
I would not say it was most impressive. It was a plastic fender looking thing. It was terrible. Um, the type of thing where it's got coloured strings and you have to play something like, you know, um, American songs, maybe, you know, things like Clementine or Paper of Pins. And to be honest, it was never going to last long. It was, it was not the right thing for me. My sister gave her um, acoustic guitar to me, but again, it was not the right thing. It was a lot later. I would say I started writing songs from about the time I was 15. But when you write stuff at that age, it's, it's always from the point of view of, why don't girls like me? Or why am I spotty? <laughs> you know, it's the type of thing. It's, it's always obsessed with the id of a teenager who's so insecure that they, they don't only know, they don't know who they are, but they also tell other people they don't know who they are, which I always thought was, you know, it's not really... You put the names of girls in songs like Buddy Holly did with Peggy Sue. <laughs> Well, it was it was actually not meant to be Peggy Sue, was it? it? Meant to be Cindy Lou, I believe. But you know, it's a good question, Michelle. And I mean, the one thing about it was, when I picked up a guitar, it was when I first felt fluid enough or fluent enough to write something. And I did I did write um, a few songs about you know generally about my lesser moments with relationships. Um, one was called Strumming the Changes, and. I've got the demo of that somewhere, and I'll be honest with you, uh, I, if I did it now, I'd have to rework it completely. And there's another one, um, which is called Exchange Hotel. There's a, quite a few demos. There's probably about, maybe about 40 odd demos. Um, and I just basically sort of said, well, no, if I'm going to start, don't hang back to the past, go forward, and it, it, as you get better on guitar and you get better doing things, right at that stage rather than going back to a time when you weren't so sure of your own ability. It's, it's a bit like saying, I'm going to publish something when I was six and now you're like 50 and you want people to see what you wrote when you were six, you know. You know, I like train sets and especially train sets that run on their own or something. When what you really want to say is about how, you know, life has changed for you, how you're coping with the lockdown, you know. You, you've got to think in the now. And sometimes... Have you... Have you been writing any songs in the last six months, eight, nine months? Yes. Yeah. And when do you think they might start coming to fruition? Well, let's, as soon as this lockdown's over, actually. I, I actually have a few of them as demos on them. Um, as I don't know if ladies have seen this. But I've got this device here. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, what it is, I do, there's a list behind it. That list of the songs are demoed on it. Um, and... I, I do write stuff, and as soon as I write it, I, I use it. You know, there's one called The Time That I've Lost, um, and there's another one called, let me see, Hard To Say Goodbye, um, which I could play a little bit of if you wish. But um, there's also, interestingly enough, there's a song of Dave Holden's on this, which um, he came round one Friday night. We actually, remember that, found out when you, Bob, and I were dubbing onto that song, Dave? Uh, I remember the one, yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, and there's also uh, one where there's a version of the Dreams Out of You where uh, someone who used to be my, my local vicar came along and played on it, um, Alan Jewell, and we actually recorded it in the garden. You remember that, Judith? We recorded his, yes. his guitar solo in the garden. Yeah, it was a mad yes. idea. But, I mean, I, I, I remember sort of thinking at the time, that's what I wanted. I wanted the ability to take it anywhere. And now I've got a piano in the shed. I can do that as well. And um, one quick thing. Is before... a long question? Yeah, go on, Dave. Yeah. Uh, it's regards to basis towards Andrew, with regards to songwriting, but it's uh, probably relevant to both books and poetry too. When it comes to writing these things, how much, uh, how much grammar do you apply to it in terms of word choice and stuff like that when you're constructing um, the songs? Well, it's it's as much as like you can say, you can say writing the song, the, the amount of words or the, the amount of sounds in the line dictate you've got to have the scansion rice. You, you know, imagine say singing something like the dreams I have of you. It's quite mm -hmm. obvious that you couldn't fit something like the visions I had of you because visions then split into two syllables. Um, and you, you've also got to make sure that you've got the the correct inflection, so you can't say. The dreams I have of you, mm. the dreams I have of you, you know, like you're coming off a ski slope. You, you've got to have the right, the right inflection and the right way in which you express them. Some words it's are not also, 
it's also the balance of sometimes some people, some critics can also claim to be too vague, but also too literal. It's like trying to find the balance between the two so that the message is there, but it's not too in your face, but not too smoke and mirrors that people are thinking, what was that about? You know? Well, you know, well, well, it depends again. I mean, what was that uh, first line of that caper song? I still dream of organ on and I wake up crying, you know, cloud busting. Mm. People think, well, what, the, what it is, is the trying to think of well, how does that relate to the title? And it, it's a, about a, a child's relationship with a scientist father who makes a machine that can, well, bust clouds and make rain. And you've got to listen to the whole thing to make sense of it. But again, you know, I, I think a lot of critics, the problem is they put on the record and expect to be impressed by the first 30 seconds. Um, I'm pretty sure there were people who wrote about Hey Jude, you know, and basically rubbished it because, well, you know, it didn't get the point. And bear in mind, everyone is potentially a critic. I mean, there's a famous Kenneth Williams quote about when they went in to see a review he was in, and these two old ladies came out of Brighton. And, uh, you know, they were asked, oh, what did you think of the play? It was all right, but they had no plot. Because it was a review. It was a series. Well, it's, I mean, it's going back to, like, for example, going through, like, music and uh, poetry. Like, there's one song which um, I really, really like from back in the 70s by a band called Rush, and it's called Xanadu. But it's actually, I don't know if you've ever heard of it at all, but yeah, it's yeah, actually yeah. based yeah. off yeah. a poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge called Kubla Khan. Yeah, and Xanadu and did the Kubla Khan is Pleasure Palace. Bill, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the one. But the thing is, when I heard it at first, it wasn't quite sure what it was actually about, you know, just because I was listening first more to the music and the lyrics. But then when I actually read through it and where it was going, I thought, wow. <laughs> and then real research didn't realise it was a poem at first, but, but it's amazing but, where inspiration comes from. Rush were, were huge readers. I mean, there's, uh, we mentioned this last week. It's a famous story when they toured with someone that could have been Aerosmith or the Rolling Stones, and someone said to them, well, what they like then? We go, well, we don't hang out with them. Why not? Well, they, they just go to their rooms and read books. <laughs> and the other band were there, you know, having wild parties, and drinking a lot and playing with cigarettes well, and women. And, and Rush were just in their, in their rooms re reading poetry and reading well, songs. Well, Anne Rand got them into a bit of trouble. Oh, yeah, Anne Rand, time. yeah, yeah. Anne yeah. Rand, yeah, um, with Fountainhead. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Andrew, come on, let, let's, have, let's have a song and then we'll, we'll have a, a last whiz round people... Having a little chat. So, what are you going to do for us now? Uh, Excuse me, I have to make a phone call, and it is getting on very late. Okay. Um. See you again. Nice. See you again, Tony. And you. Nice see you later, Bye. 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 Bye, Judy. Love you. Bye, Trevor. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, Andrew. Okay, Judy, Bye. If you take care of yourself. I'll be in touch, love. Take care. See you again. That was great. I enjoyed that. Thank I'm sorry. I have to. Um, Not a problem. Oh. All right. Not a problem. Okay. Bye. 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 So, Andrew, fill, fill us in on your uh, on what okay. is what it's about. Now, a lot of a lot of the open mic circuits tend to be very insular. Everybody knows everybody else, but they always know each other across a, a, a very small area. Um, a good example of this is in the Walton and Gatica areas, where there are a few open mics, but everybody does know each other. And that's how Dave and I met, actually, how I met Dave Holden um, some eight years ago. In fact, nearly nine years ago, Dave. Oh, oh wow. I didn't yeah, we were getting on that. <laughs> yeah. What happened in this instance was that um, before I actually got properly into being an open mic thing, uh, a friend of all the stars, who was um, one of the most prominent people in it, and his wife lost him just before Christmas, and they have a little girl. And if you imagine, I, had, I was asked to do a, a night where we were all going to pay tribute to Alan, and I wanted to try and write a, a song. What I did was, was um, I, I tried to write a song, and then Dave asked me to write a song about an altercation he'd had with someone, and I said, I, I don't know if I can do it, because I don't feel, I don't feel that anger. It's a bit like being Bernie Taupin and Elton John. You can't, you can't write someone else's anger. You can only relate to how you, you feel yourself. So I said, look, I've got an idea for that tune. Could I use it? I remember because I asked, actually asked, would you mind if I use it for someone else? And the song 
um, became I Wish You Were Here. And it was actually um, composed over the Easter weekend of 2013. In the quiet of the room. Mostly empty space. No voice but my own. In the corner of a case. Guitar still unplayed. The door still great for you. But it's never seen a tune. I wish you were here. Now you have gone. The world has been built. It's over and done. You wrote down your life. The pages cut off. Spirit so wide, always buried. I wish you were here Now you have gone The world that we built Is over and done I wish you were here Now you have gone The shadows grow low I'll cast by myself I'll to play your song You take it from the shelf And listen to others Though I love them too Just want to hear your voice again I'm so in tune with you I wish you were here We like that. That was rather good. So, would I think um, Karen and um, Trevor should should be asking a, a quick question or two as well. Yeah, I mean, Karen, I, I feel I know you, and I don't know where I know you from. I don't know. A lot of people say that. I must have one of those faces. Uh, I was just wondering about your songwriting process. Do you um, produce the lyrics first, or do the lyrics and tune come simultaneously? I've, I've been asked this before. Funny enough, Dave's asked me this. Um, sometimes you get you get a poem and you think that sounds good, and then you think, what would it sound like if I put to music? And often you've got like an orphaned tune. Do you know what I mean? You 
you know, Trevor and Dave, you'll know what I mean on this. You've got you got a framework for something, but you haven't got the words. And mm-hmm. I find that sometimes I've got the words first. Other times I've got the tune first. And sometimes there can be a tendency to come up with something really, you know, just like a filler, just like a place marker. I I remember reading about Paul McCartney going around to Donovan's house and saying, hey, John, I've got this song to play for you. What is it? All on a tongue. And I'm like, what's that? And of course, it's Eleanor Rigby, but he he didn't have the name. Hmm. Miss Daisy Hawkins. Likewise, when he wrote yesterday, he had it as scrambled eggs. So my baby, how I love your legs. So he had the tune, but he didn't have the words. And that sometimes has happened to me. And sometimes you can find that some ideas a lurk in the background you can actually rework them a bit it it, it depends pretty much on the song oh, I, right. I i find most of the time um it's it's a kind of happenstance it's alchemy really you know yeah. you can you can invent something i wouldn't make any great egotistical claims for what i do it's nice that people said that they like stuff that's nice what tony has said but i would say there are people out there who are far better players than i am i'm far better lyricist however I, I tend to suffer as I've always done from a little bit of um, reserve nerves if you like and um, so on here I'm fine but you put me in front of people I take my contact lenses out so I can't see them hmm. I've really I, enjoyed I, what you've done thank well, you no it's been it's been, thank you. It's been very kind it's very, very kind of you. what I'd like you to do all of you by the way I, I mean Dave's already bought because he's on my album and he'll be on the next one and oh, Trevor, you to tell me black <laughs> But no, I'm, on, I'm not really on your album, you know. But I mean, I'd like it if um, if you wanted copies of it, I could send you all a copy free of charge, you know. Because I, I still believe in the physical format, the idea that you've got a disc. I don't like the idea of, you know, downloads. You can't put your arms around the memory. You know, you need something that you can actually insert in a player, you know. I'm pretty There's sure more art involved in the album. Yeah, and also I think the reason why a lot of people don't like, you know, they say, oh, I like to stream stuff. The reason why I don't like to stream stuff is because it's convenience. But they're not seeing it in the way that you see, say, something like food. You can have food as a big formal meal with your family and cooked at home. Or you could have a takeaway meal. Or you could sit in a restaurant and eat it. Or sit on your garden wall and have fish and chips. You know, you can have it anywhere you want. And likewise with music. For outside, yes, I do listen to my phone and I've got an iPod, things like that. But for inside, as you can see, I've got records, I've got CDs. I love physical formats and things. They take up all room. But um, I suppose it's just essentially that I like things where I can look at them, I can look at the artwork, I can appreciate what they are, you know. We, we should really ask Michelle and Dave, being the young people. Are you, Michelle, are you a, 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 physical, Thank you very much. a physical record? Well, but Karen Cannon's the youngest of the lot here. <laughs> <laughs> She's our juvenile delinquent. So, Michelle, are you, are you a download person or an owner, a CD or a record person? Um, so, I'm quite ethical. So... I will both stream and buy the album because I know people get paid a pittance like Amazon, that, mm. which is a swear word probably with you and me. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll believe it. Don't worry. <laughs> and um, Spotify, I'll listen to it. But if I really love something, I will buy an album to support the band mm. because they get something like 0.005% per play, don't they? Yeah. And that's horrifying to me. So I'll pay a decent amount for a really good bit of vinyl, yeah. which you can't see, but there is a whole wall. Not as oh, much we can, as we can sort of see actually now, now. More so now you've pointed in that direction. Yeah, so that's we've got decks and, and Dave, mixes and stuff. Dave's going to hold something up now. Well, it's just a random one from the collection over there, but it's to, to illustrate the point. I mean, I'm still very much an album person because I always find that I think with streaming i can understand it too if you try if you were if artists were like promoting singles for records upcoming but i think a lot of the album is taken away when the whole complete work is just on streaming services like spotify for example certain the artwork involved the people involved all this information about how this record came together is unknown 
well, unless you, you actually buy the actual physical copy. Whether it's copy. a liner notes and everything. What album is it, Dave? Yeah, it, it's it's like a story. It's like a story in its of itself, you know, like of how it came to be, you know, as well as the songs involved. What, know, what album is it? Which, which one are you holding up? Oh, this one. Um, I, just, I just picked one up at random. It's called Grace for Drowning. Um, by an artist called Stephen Wilson. Um, basically, I mean, Andrew often refers to me as this. Uh, basically, I do have an interest in more progressive music, you know, like progressive rock, you know, like uh, Pink Floyd, Rush, that sort of thing, as I mentioned earlier. And one thing that's drawn me to the Lord that was more like, for example, the the lyrical content of not always a simple song about like you know falling in love or driving in a car, but sometimes in some some songs regards you're being told a story. Like there's um, there's one song by this artist called The Holy Drinker, and um, basically it's about um, a priest who is an alcoholic and he challenges the devil to a drinking competition but oh, loses yes. <laughs> and ends up getting dragged to hell <laughs> as a result very of it. Robert, Robert Johnson, that, that, isn't that a, um, Rob, yeah, Robert Johnson? Yeah, yeah. Bit, bit, of, bit of crossroads involved, you know, a bit of crossroads influence. Yeah. Now, Trevor, Trevor I just was love that. A real, real throwback there. Was that an audio cassette I saw, mm-hmm. Trev? Yes, it's, uh, it was Rod Argent's album, which oh, wow. is impossible to find on there. Uh, CD so far, yeah. So I've got it on top of um, this converter thing to uh, oh, di- uh, digitize wait, wait, wait. it. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, mate of mine did a load of that. He mm. is he moved house and got married for the second time. And when he moved in, his his new wife said, "So what 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 stuff are you bringing in?" He bought in these huge big boxes of, of CDs and vinyl. She went, "They're not going in the lounge." <laughs> So he bought one of these digitising things and, and quickly digitised it all. All A bit like Andrew's man cave there, like Ian's. It, he had the loft converted and he's got all his records up in the loft and he's recording stuff because he's a musician. And he just has like, a, a, you know, an audio player thing in the lounge. Um, yeah, so, so is that your little hobby is finding all your old stuff and transferring it, yeah? I think there's too much vinyl and um, there's huge boxes of CD, um, of cassettes um, tucked under the bed and elsewhere, including a lot of gigs, a lot of bands over the years. Um, You've archived yours, don't you, Trevor? You've archived your your gig tapes? um, I I used to, but um, the task became bigger and bigger. The the challenge is often, how do you master what you've done? I used to sit for ages with a Philips CD recorder, pressing pause on a on a mini disc and that sort of thing, only to find the message coming up too big after about three hours. You know, <laughs> uh, you just get hold of the stuff, sling it across the room, and go and make a cup of tea. You know, so. Yeah. And Cameron, are you a, a real or a download girl? I'm a download, I'm afraid. Oh, yeah. Oh, she is oh, the interesting. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. I haven't got room in my house for them. I haven't got room in my house. No, that's, that's the other side of it, isn't it? It, it, it helps to have space. Alban, down at the bottom. Hello. Are you a, a, a real hoarder of records? And... I, I'm a bit of a hoarder. I, 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 I'm, I'm in awe of all these real musicians you keep on having on your programme. So. Well, uh, yeah, but that, that's lost to you all. So, I, and I've only just learned to play a CD player myself. So, but in my next life, I'm definitely going to be a musician. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I, I like the tactile thing about uh, CDs. Yeah. Can I, uh, can I show you something, by the way? Can course, I show can. you something special? Right, this is addressed to me, little parcel. And it's dated, what was it? 2016. Now, I've just done some recordings with a friend of ours, Johnny Larson. And, um, what it was, I did the recordings and speak that. In fact, um, Trev, you know about this. And I decided what I really wanted was the opportunity to have my own piece of vinyl. So I have. So that's an actual hey. press record of yours, yeah? That's, now what it is, is they use what's called a, a one-off process. They have, um, these are actually vinyl blanks. They used to make them acetates and they had a metal core. And the uh, problem with the acetates, if you can find any from the 1960s, they're very brittle. They don't last long. Um, and in this instance, um, 
I was worried in case he sent me an acetate, which is very heavy and they're, they are brittle. But no, this is actually vinyl. And it contains, um, I wish you were here, the song you hear tonight. And another one, which is join you in your dance. But it cost me, I might as well tell you, Karen, you'll be disgusted. I expect you to be disgusted. It cost me 23 quid. Um, but it was like, I just wanted to see how it would sound on single. It actually did sound very good because, of course, they master it with the appropriate EQ and compression things. Otherwise, if you didn't, it, the needle would jump out of the place. But I, I love having a record, my own stuff. And it was like, it was just a sort of vanity thing more than anything else. It wasn't it's, because... It's coming back now. People like you are making vinyl now, aren't they? Quite a lot of my musician friends, they seem to sell probably more vinyl than they do CDs or downloads. And, and there's you... some really quality, high quality vinyl coming out. I mean, yeah. do you remember in the 80s when they were like the so, so thin? The, yeah. the albums, it got thinner and thinner, didn't it? And suddenly yeah. now you buy a decent and album. CDs and soon came along. But do you know who the worst were for that? We're, um, a firm called KTEL. I remember them, yeah. Because KTEL used to edit down the tracks. And they'd also, you know, to make out 20 golden greats of the 50s or something. They'd edit down the tracks or they'd reduce the volume. So you put it on record player and there'd be a little instruction and tiny right in the back please play this record loud, because you'd never hear it. Um, hmm. And the one thing about it, they always used to use uh, recycled stock. So say if a record sold poorly, and someone at um, Decker or EMI had all the records ground down into dust, they'd say, right, we'll make you an offer for that. You know, it's like it's old now. You don't really want that. And they'd press KTEL records out of it. And they always pressed albums. They never did singles, right? I mean, the reason for that was because they could keep the cost low. And also, they were using recycled vinyl anyway. So when you were paying your £2.25 for a say, KTEL album, say, in 1973, what you were getting for the, for the price was probably something that was only worth 25 pence. And they had an aspiration of everybody who was on it. Um, but they did an awful lot of that. I mean, you're right. The, the quality of them is improving uh, because people now realise the collectability of it. You know. In the early 60s, there was a booth near the swimming baths in New Brighton where you could record onto disc. And certain well, hooligans were... I knew crowded in with the acoustic guitars and made a recording. And I've still got the thing in a drawer here. Wow. <laughs> wow. Like there was a six inch record or something. Yeah. Hiya, little one. <laughs> Hiya, Michelle. It's, it's Michelle's daughter. Hello. Michelle, oh, introduce hello. your daughter. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Are you taking your mic off mute? Your mic's muted. Your mic's muted, Michelle. No, Michelle, Michelle mute your mic. Muted. She can't say hello. You'll have to unmute so she can say hello. Oh, hang on. Anyone got Michelle's telephone number? No. <laughs> um. oh, Michelle, you're muted. <laughs> hang on, Michelle. <laughs> It's fine. It's, it's it's come it's come to the end, really, isn't it? It's uh, we're we're well, roughly at bedtime, aren't we? We're roughly. Well, put it this way, I mean, I've enjoyed this. I would like to make a suggestion. Um, yeah. I'd like to hear from the the ladies who are interested in writing books, from Karen and Michelle again. I really would like to hear from you. I would like to hear from you, album, to hear your particular points of view on all things. And Trevor Evans and David Holden. I think you should feature as musicians on future editions of this. And um, Trevor is one of these people who's he has an encyclopedic knowledge of everything you can get from a guitar and the effects, everything about it. Um, does he play and likewise, as well, do you, do, do you play? He, much, does he play guitar? Yeah, that's that's like asking Bing Crosby, can he sing off the Beatles made a few records? <laughs> you, you kind of slightly underestimate Trevor's ability there. That's I mean. Good. <laughs> well, when I first met Trevor, it would be the summer of 2019. I was doing a set at um, the Gorse Fest in, on the world in Wallasey. And you know when you give, get someone out and they say, oh, could you do this? And he goes, yeah, all right. And I was playing bass. And he was like, I thought, I didn't need to tell him because he instinctively knows where to take it. This is a gift that, that Dave Holden has. You know, in that he knows instinctively where to think, oh, he will suggest something. And it's 
it's kind of like it's a it's true collaboration. It's not like I think your idea is rubbish. I won't do it. You see what I mean by that, Karen? You know, where somebody where somebody will suggest something to improve or enhance an idea, not to throw out your original idea. Yeah. And there could be there could be times when Dave um, could get a little bit. Mm, how could I put it? It could get a little bit particular, and I like that. And I think that people should be particular, especially if you're doing something which you'd like other people to hear. But you want to hear, pardon me, you want it to be heard at its best. You don't want to be putting out something that's a little. You know, I think that's the one thing that's a little bit different between music and books. Yeah, I was thinking people that. People who do books tend to work mostly on their own until they have to collaborate with a proofreader or an editor. But if you're in a, a musical group of any sort, um, you've got to you've got to work with other people, haven't you? Really, unless you're Nick Drake and you just drop off the the, the album and go and. So a lot of it depends on Nick Drake's problems. Songs. Where he he had he had troubles in his life. He had a lot of problems in his life, Nick Drake. And it I, I, that's also. Go on, man. Depends on the song. It depends on who wrote the song, if it was one person or a group of people, yeah. really. Yeah. If it's one person, then it's a similar vein, as you say, with regards to like the novelist, you know, writing the book. And then when it's introduced to other people, then they can add their own opinions to it, feel if there's anything that needs to be added or taken away, it's a similar thing. Oh, you're back. So you, need, <laughs> you, you need that head-to-head -head approach sometimes. Yeah. You need people to tell you, anyway, that's good, that's bad. Listen, guys, we, we've, we've, we've pretty much run out of time because um, it's come up to half nine. I'm sure I think Michelle's got a bedtime duty to do up there. <laughs> I do. I'm very late. Oh, yeah. But it, uh, we Michelle, haven't necessarily got um, work in the morning, have we? Oh, by the way, what's your daughter's name? This is Sarah. Sarah, say hello. Uh, they Sarah, can hear you. Could you bring it closer to the camera? Or, or yeah, some, there you go. Know. Come closer. Good, good night, Sarah. Take care, sweetheart. Oh, oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> Say good night. This is just like a lesson, Sarah. This is like, you know, your teachers do Zoom. She yeah. can't hear you. Hold on. <laughs> Time to go to bed. Time oh. to go to bed. <laughs> Not again. She is on Sarah, yeah. Goodbye. Oh. So it's like um, a school Zoom just for teachers. This is what teachers do in the evening. When you're not reply to them, they can hear you. I never knew Mum was a teacher. Well, no, we're like <laughs> we're getting together. You've been promoted, enjoy it. So, do you do Zoom with your teachers? Do you do this with your? Um, in the mornings, I do. Yeah. So, are you enjoying it? What or do you do in the afternoon? Real school. I mean, I like online school more than on the normal school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I <laughs> see your friends in on on Zoom like this. Is that nice? Yeah. 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 Uh, so, do you help your mum with the books? Right. Sometimes. <laughs> you read them and review them. Yeah. Hope you get right. Have hair on, Tony. Yeah. Have hair on next get... time. Does she pay you? Don't don't tell you. No. She needs to pay you a penny a word. <laughs> penny a word. Mum <laughs> <laughs> has no idea you're saying <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> Seven... I'm not telling you. <laughs> Count the words and tell her how many words there are in a penny a word. She just she'll be fine with that. Error. <laughs> right. Tell her that you want us to read your version of War and Peace. <laughs> so I hope he's telling you about how important it is to read more books. Yes, we are. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying that she <laughs> reading is very important. She's she she should be on a penny a word, and you should oh. have a penny a word. And she could do reviews. Typical of a book publisher. Starts with really big, thick books. <laughs> you'll get really good value out of her then. <laughs> yeah, I've been trying. You know, I, I say, oh, maybe you could write a review. Yeah. And I'm like, no. Oh. <laughs> I've got her to write one letter oh. to an author, which yeah. was a triumph, trying to get her to just so she could actually write something. It'll come. So, yeah. It'll come. Oh, I'll forward you. Scholastic have got a, a children's writing competition for seven to 14 year olds. Oh, so she could have a look at that, you see. Yeah, it she depends might... what the prize is, you know. I might have to make up my own prize a week in the Seychelles or something. <laughs> no, you, you go in a compilation, like uh, you know, an anthology. I'll, I'll, I'll forward oh, you the, the, the email so you can have a look at it. Um, yeah, I'm best going leave. Don't worry. 
<laughs> I'm going, Sarah. I am. I'm going to say goodbye now. So thank you very much for joining us. Michelle. It's I'll, been a joy. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Andrew. Pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah. Bye for now. Take Bye. Care. Take Bye. care, all of you. Bye. 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 Leave me. <laughs> right, I'm, I'm, so just, I'm going to stop the recording because I think we've. Uh,